Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Kupfer. I'm the president of Conserve America. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meeks uh, from Iowa. And she's joining us as part of our series of conversations with members of Congress who've made real contributions in the area of conservation, energy, and environment uh, in Congress. And Congresswoman uh, Miller Meeks uh, represents Iowa's first district. She's finishing up her second term. Previously, she served in the U.S. Army and as a physician, uh, and she ran an ophthalmology practice, and she also ran the Iowa Department of Public Health uh, before going into uh, politics full time. And even though she's only been in Congress uh, in her second term, she's made significant contributions already, and that's what we want to talk to her about today. So, Congresswoman, Congresswoman, uh, welcome, and uh, we're happy to have you today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeff. It's delightful to be with you. So this is my second term. So I'm uh, finishing up my fourth year in Congress and uh, the current chair of the Conservative Climate Con uh, Caucus, a little bit earlier than I wanted to be. Uh, but uh, Representative John Curtis, who started the Conservative Climate Caucus, uh, is running for the Senate. And so I've taken over that role. And he has very big shoes to fill. And I only have a size six shoe. So uh, that gives you any indication of the heavy lift in front of us. Um, I joined the Conservative Climate Caucus when I came into Congress uh, in 2021. Uh, as a matter of fact, my seat was still up for grabs at that time. I had won by six votes out of uh, 394,000, and Nancy Pelosi was trying to oust me uh, through a little-known uh, provision of the Constitution, Article, 5, Article 1, Section 5, where Congress shall seat its members, and I didn't know that meant Congress could overturn um, a state certified election. But needless to say, the reason why I joined was that I felt that um, regardless of what you believe about man-made climate change or man's impact uh, to the climate or the ability for us to actually change the climate, um, I felt that Republicans needed to be in this space. We, number one, I'm uh, from an agricultural state, originally from Texas, but um, you know our farmers are uh, the original conservationists. Uh, certainly, uh, President Roosevelt of the Republican Party uh, is uh, who set aside uh, lands for conservation, lands for public use, and our national parks. So we have a long, rich history. But most importantly, if there is no other alternative voices, you only hear one thing. And it was very um, uh, dismaying to me to hear people call climate deniers just because they may have had a different point of view. So I really thought Republicans needed to be in this space. I know it was something that young people also were, were concerned about and wanted to talk about. And we were doing a lot in Iowa, both on the energy front, as well as on water quality and other, um, you know, stewardship of the land and agriculture. No one in, in Iowa, no farmer wants to see a repeat of the 1930s and what happened to farmland uh, at that time. So uh, given that, I joined the Conservative Climate Caucus in February. I think there were about 20, 25 members at the time I joined and uh, then have continued since there. I also want to highlight why this is important in my state. Um, and so Iowa has over 50 percent of its energy from renewables. We have over now 60 percent of our electricity is from wind and we are a net exporter of energy. So we have the entire gamut of renewables. So we have wind and solar, which people typically think of renewables, but renewables are vastly beyond that. We also have compressed renewable natural gas, which is not made from the food product necessarily. It can be made from any organic matter. Uh, we have uh, ethanol, we have biodiesel, we have compressed renewable natural gas, as I mentioned, we have biomass, we have manure, which is made into energies, and we have some farms that actually have closed loop operations and sell electricity back to the grid. We have self-generation with uh, solar panels on homes, less uh, so self-generation with wind. Um, and we had to uh, you know, do some legislation in state government when I was a state senator to address self-generation. Somebody needs to pay for poles, transformers, and lines. Uh, and so uh, that's why we had to, um, to do some energy policy, even in state government. I went to COP three times, the past three COPs. So uh, my first year uh, in Congress, 
uh, despite being discouraged to do so, because I, I'm in a swing district, a very tough district for Republicans. Uh, but I went here to talk about, number one, what Iowa has done without mandates and emission standards. Number two, agriculture is continually penalized in the climate uh, scenario and in climate talks. And this was 2023 was the first year that the International Panel on, Panel on Climate Change in the UN acknowledged uh, American farmers' contribution to lowering emissions. Overall, as the chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus, uh, we're helping to educate uh, members of Congress and also allow people to be able to converse about climate, the environment, and energy in a way that's not um, off-putting to individuals and in which they're comfortable with. I have an overall arching principle, and I typically say this every time I speak uh, on this issue, and that is we all want to leave a cleaner, healthier planet to our children and grandchildren, but we have to be able to compete economically around the globe in a global competitive environment. To do so, we need affordable, reliable, abundant, and secure energy. And so with that, that kind of gives you a framework of where I am and what uh, where I'm going. Well, that's extremely helpful. And for those of us who care about a responsible approach to energy, environment, and climate. We're glad those extra half dozen or so voters came out and uh, and any attempt to keep you out of Congress uh, was unsuccessful. Um, you, you talked a lot about what the Conservative Climate Caucus is about and, and, and why you joined. Can you take a couple uh, minutes and, and just tell us, are there specific goals of the caucus itself? And do you have a particular vision of the caucus going forward that may or may not be similar to where it's been in the last couple of years? So I think, you know, first and foremost was acquiring members and educating members, uh, you know, on our policies, where we are uh, and where we may have differences from some of the radical environmentalists and, and some on the left. Um, and this, I'm not denigrating anybody. I'm just saying we're trying to make uh, Republicans comfortable with climate um, and environment and energy, and all three of those are certainly intertwined. Um, and so we'd like to see the caucus continue to grow, uh, continue to help members to be able to talk about this subject in a way in which they're comfortable. Uh, but also, we want to model the uh, caucus, if you will, after some of the other caucuses, such as the Western Caucus or Republican Main Street. So not only to be education members, help members with communication, but to look into policy, help put forward policy or respond to policy. Uh, and one of the first things will be what happens with the IRA. We also want to help to have an arm of, uh, of the Republican conservative Republican caucus uh, that would uh, receive contributions and have a PAC. So we're doing things to give value to our members because we want the caucus to continue to grow. We have about 80 members now, and most of the members have joined because uh, they have an um, interest in conservation. They live in certain areas of the country that are very beautiful. They want to see those preserved. They may have national parks within their area. Some of them have um, uh, critical minerals or mining. And this is an area which, for us, uh, we're very interested in seeing the United States bring um, mining of critical minerals and processing uh, of those because we know we can do that in a more environmentally friendly way than is currently happening in uh, the Democratic Republic of, of uh, the Congo. Uh, but we also know that um, in, in the processing uh, there are, and utilizing our natural resources, it was one of the things that has helped the United States to become a powerhouse economically. So we shouldn't shy away from using the natural resources we have in the United States, of which we have an abundance, uh, but we need to be able to do that in an environmentally responsible way, which we can. All right. You, you mentioned the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed uh, in 2022, uh, as you know, passed by reconciliation, no Republican uh, votes in favor of it, has a variety of different provisions in it, some of which had grown up in a, in a previous bipartisan manner, others hadn't. Um, so how do you look at the Inflation Reduction Act as we current, as we sit here today and uh, going forward in terms of how a possible Republican president or Republican uh, majorities in Congress should deal with it? So I think that's a great question. And first and foremost, I'm going to remind uh, your listeners 
the Inflation Reduction Act, as you said, passed by reconciliation. So this this is a budget gimmick, if you will. Uh, and you have to coordinate with the Senate to do it. It was very difficult for it to pass. But most importantly, it wasn't done in a bipartisan fashion. This did not go through the regular order process of Congress. What do I mean by that? Uh, typically, the way bills are passed are that um, uh, you have, uh, you know, different uh, bills that are passed. They go through the subcommittee, then they go through the committee, then they go through the broader committee, and in this case would also go through appropriations committee. None of that happened uh, in this uh, process. Furthermore, it wasn't just the energy components uh, that were in this bill. This also had 87,000 new IRS agents, which even the Washington Post said that over 75% of these audits would target people making under 200,000 a year. That's very problematic, we think, and it's a tax on all Americans, especially those who can least afford it. Uh, you know, to have to get uh, accountants or tax professionals to be able to do taxes, which someone may do now, and it makes the tax code more complicated. And then people are gonna be less likely to take their legal deductions because they're afraid of getting audited by the IRS with 87,000 new IRS agents. The other thing that was involved in this was uh, provisions that are related to uh, Medicare um, uh, drug pricing, uh, Medicare negotiating drug pricing, and provisions that are going to make it very difficult to get orphan drugs, drugs for rare diseases, uh, to get those uh, medications across the finish line and get the research and development into those medications. It's already had a very dampening effect on the ph pharmaceutical in industry here in the United States. But interestingly enough, when I've traveled abroad and I've met with pharmaceutical companies abroad, they are very well aware of the IRA and the impact that it's going to have on them. So this will have a dramatic impact on the availability of medications and cures uh, in the future. So those provisions were also in the IRA. Now, were there provisions within the IRA that Republicans would have supported? One, if it had gone through regular order. And two, if we had had even a chance to participate, and three, if it hadn't have been jumbled together with all this other stuff, and absolutely there would have been. As you know, we, you had uh, Republicans who are, were ba barely freshman members. We had only been reelected and started our second term, and they were willing to go up against leadership in the debt limit negotiations, which tried to strip out the IRA. Uh, and so these are um, a category of uh, tax credits, uh, the 45 Qs, the 45 Zs, those are related to pipeline, pipeline development from the standpoint of Iowa used for carbon sequestration, but also I have chemical uh, entities in my district and they use pipelines as well. Uh, so any type of pipeline uh, benefits from the 45 Qs. And then the 45 Z is related to uh, crops, cover crops, carbon credits, those things our farmers are using. I have several young farmers who are teaching other farmers how to get carbon credits and uh, you know and how to make that economically viable for them. So there are definitely things within the IRA we would want to um, have conversations about protecting. But I've talked with uh, Leader Scalise and some of leadership about this. And one of the things, if we want to try to promote and protect some of these, uh, and, and nuclear is another one that we'd want to protect, we're going to have to come up with ways to either cut spending or raise revenue in other areas as we go through to protect them. So that's one of the things that we're going to have to start looking at is how to maintain those and how to um, to be able to pay for those. Are there other provisions other than the ones you mentioned, but maybe in the energy space that you think are le or climate space that are that are less valuable than some of the ones that you did mention when you talked about the 45Q and the and, and others? Yeah. So I think Republicans find pro very problematic uh, the, um, you know, the electric uh, vehicle uh, charging stations. And as you know, Tesla's pulled out of their original agreement. Uh, very little has been made on that front to this point. And then also the subsidies for electric vehicles. Mostly it's because it goes up to an income level of 500000 And I think if you're making 500000 a year, you don't need to get a subsidy or tax credit in order to buy an electric vehicle. We've also seen that abused before in the past where electric vehicles were golf carts, and we don't think that we necessarily need to pay for people to purchase golf carts uh, uh, to be utilized on their property. Not that they're not a good idea, not that they don't save people from uh, using a liquid fuel, 
but is that really the intent uh, of this? So those things I think are going to be problematic in the IRA. Uh, that if uh, you know, for us, a choice in vehicles is very important. Liquid fuels are very important to give people choice, to give people range. Um, and I think when you look at um, vehicles and vehicle choice, hybrids seem to make a lot of sense. I've had two Honda Civic hybrids, loved both of those vehicles, uh, actually got put ethanol in them or blended fuel in them, as well as uh, I, you know, I drove them for the first one for 439,000 miles and the second one 429,000 miles. I was trying to get 500,000 miles, but my clutch went out. And my husband said it would cost more to repair the clutch than it would than the vehicle was worth. So he wouldn't. But I never had a problem with the battery in either of those vehicles, even though uh, if you look at the uh, instruction manual or the operator's manual, it'll tell you that at 100,000 miles, you're supposed to have the battery replaced, but never had a battery for that. Which then brings us to the next thing. And that's where we source critical minerals for certain types of renewables. The amount of steel that goes into wind turbines, the amount of petroleum. Uh, the lifespan of eight to uh, 10 years for solar panels where we, um, and for storage, where we get the critical minerals, lithium, cobalt, rare earths, uh, those are all problematic, uh, especially when sourced uh, from overseas. Great. Okay. Well, you've, you've covered a whole lot there. Um, and uh, and it, it's been re really informative. Before we wrap up, let me just give you a chance to talk about anything else that you think is kind of unfinished business that you've been focused on that you want the, uh, the, the, the viewers of this to know uh, as we go forward over the rest of this Congress? Well, certainly we haven't talked yet about transmission and transmission lines and permitting. Um, you know, for the Republicans, permitting reform is extremely important. We were able to get permitting, some permitting reform, NEPA reforms. We're not in all uh, suggesting doing away with environmental studies. We just want environmental study to be done. And then we don't want unending lawsuits um, in relationship to those environmental studies. Or once an environmental study is done, that then a group can come up and say, oh, but now you have to look at this. And so you could continue to extend the environmental study. Um, that was passed, it was agreed to on the Senate, signed by the president, but then the president is preferentially using uh, permitting reform for only the industries he wants. We want this to be broad-based broad and we want the White House and the administration to be honest brokers. Uh, we're willing to discuss transmission and permitting and transmission, but we first need to see that the permitting reform is utilized as the way it was agreed to. So those are two big things. And then lastly, um, and you know, this is in reference to your the name of your organization. We cannot forget about conservation and organic life. All life is carbon based. Uh, and one of the best ways that we can do to help our environment reduce carbon emissions is through planting things, whether it's Bruce Westerman's trillion dollar trees, whether it's how we grow crops and how we reduce emissions through that. Uh, biochar is another one of the things that we can do, growing trees, and when they get to about 200 years, their, um, their carbon uh, aspiration decreases, but then they can be selectively harvested and that organic material used through pyrolyzers to make biochar, which can go into soil water purification, um, and so there's a lot we can do and a lot we haven't even talked about, but I don't want us to forget about the conservation efforts, which really do improve our environment and make the United States, you know, one of the places people want to come to hike, to live. My husband's on the Appalachian Trail now, the third time through hiking it. It's the most hiked trail in the world. But, you know, we want to have these beautiful spaces for people to be able to you know, to go, to meditate, to walk, to be with one another, to be in nature. And we have an abundance of that in the United States. Well, you certainly put it very well. I mean, the conservation, the environment, energy, the economy, they all they all go together. And and uh, that that's what we're all about. And and it was great to, to talk to you today. Uh, we look forward to your inspired leadership of the Conservative Climate Caucus. And we look forward to working with you and your colleagues in, in the years to come. So thanks for taking the time today. Wonderful to speak with you all. Okay, take care. Thanks.